like to thank Jerry and New Era for uh, providing this opportunity to uh, present these crypto topics. Uh, as Jerry's pointed out, this is going to be the first in a, a year-long series of sessions on uh, crypto and System Z. Um, really excited about the opportunity and hoping that it's going to fill a gap in uh, education on, on the crypto infrastructure that's available uh, on System Z. And I do have a lot more material, so it, it might even go more longer than a year. Uh, today we're going to start out with uh, an intro to crypto, uh, kind of a general introduction to things. Um, with one or two exceptions, uh, everything that we're going to talk about today is, is general crypto. It's not really IBM specific. Um, what I'm hoping to accomplish today is, is to help you understand what the what cryptography provides so that in later sessions we can talk about how the IBM techno technology uh, can solve your business problems. Uh, again, this has been intended to be a general introduction to crypto functionality. We're not going to cover crypt, uh, the history of crypto from the dark ages, uh, maybe a little bit of the recent his history, uh, and especially in terms of the current algorithms. Uh, and, and we are going to focus from an IBM perspective so, uh, you know, so we can relate things back to IBM. Uh, with that, I'm going to go to slide three of the presentation. Um, cryptography is, is the practice and, and study of uh, hiding information. Uh, it's related to both math and computer science as well as information theory and engineering. Uh, so it can be confusing and intimidating. But the, the fact that it relies on math, that's something that computers uh, do really well. Uh, so it's very appropriate to be able to implement that in, in the hardware. Um, one of the other websites that I looked at talks about the fact that cryptography is both an art and a science, and, and that's very true. There is some very heavy math, but it's just math. It, it's something that computers do well. Uh, but there's an art to it as well, because you have to make sure that you don't do something that maybe leaves a door open, that uh, somebody can find your key material or, or get access to your keys, because we're going to see as we go along that uh, if you don't protect your keys, uh, that can cause a breakdown in your cryptographic uh, system. Let's turn to slide four. Uh, have you ever thought about what it what it takes to establish trust? Um, you know, from a personal perspective, you know, when you meet somebody, uh, you can look them in the eye and shake their hand. Uh, maybe after you've talked to them a while, you recognize their voice so that um, when you get on a phone call with them, you can recognize their voice. But but how do we establish trust in, uh, in an environment, in an online environment, in the Internet world that we live in today? Um, cryptography can help us with that. Uh, in addition, you, know, you want to protect uh, data. You want to provide some confidentiality for your data, whether it be uh, things like trade secrets or, or business transactions, you know, the dollars that are flowing back and forth. And then, of course, uh, you know, there's a big requirement today to provide provi privacy uh, for the personal information of your customers and in your employees. And, and cryptography can help with that. And then finally on this chart, uh, accountability and audibility has become a big hitter uh, with things like uh, HIPAA and the PCI requirements. Uh, there's almost an acknowledgement that, you know, at some point there's going to be a problem, you know, maybe some a breach of data. Can you go back and figure out, you know, how much data was compromised, how the data was compromised, so you can close that door so it can't happen again? And cryptography can, can help with all of those. So with that, we'll go to slide five, where we'll start talking about crypto functionality, again, at a high level. <clears throat> uh, the, the first bullet on here is data confidentiality. Uh, that, again, that's what most people think of when they think of cryptography, uh, taking the data, hiding it, uh, making it look like garbage. And, and the trick is, how do you know you've got the right garbage? Because uh, if you encrypt some data today and, and you can't read it, how do you know that you will be able to read it again in, in a week or three months or 10 years maybe when you have to recover that data? So you have to have a system that, that you have some confidence in that that uh, you're assured that once you scramble that data, you will be able to recover it at, at some point in the future. Now, 
um, there's two different types of uh, algorithms that can provide confidentiality. There are symmetric algorithms and there are asymmetric algorithms. Um, on this chart, uh, we list uh, two uh, types of symmetric algorithms, DES or TDES, and I'll use those interchangeably, as well as AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard. And then for asymmetric algorithms, there's RSA, there's Diffie-Hellman, and then the new kit is uh, Elliptic Curve Cryptography. Those are the algorithms that we support on the IBM crypto hardware. There are a lot of other uh, algorithms or symmetric algorithms. There's a host of other algorithms available, uh, whether it's RC4 or Blowfish or Twofish or Ideal. Um, lots and lots of algorithms are out there but again these are the ones that we support on the ibm crypto hardware and and we'll explore those algorithms as, as we go through the presentation today the another area that uh, where crypto uh, can provide some uh, assistance is the concept of integrity uh, and it actually a couple different perspectives here. There's the idea of modification detection. Can you tell that a transmission or a message was changed? Uh, that is, you know, if I send you a message, uh, when you receive that message, can you be sure that the, the message was not corrupted either intentionally or unintentionally? The idea of message authentication is, you know, can you be sure that it really came from me and not somebody that's pretending to be me? And then the third bullet there is non-repudiation. And this is the idea of can I deny sending or authorize a transaction after the fact? Now, you can imagine in our internet world today, if uh, you go online and, and order something from a big catalog store online uh, and you author, give them your credit card and, and authorize them to process and, and charge your tra your, uh, the transaction to your credit card, that catalog store is obviously wants to have some confidence that you can't come back later and deny having authorized that transaction you know, and, and deny them the payment. So uh, non-repudiation is a big idea, uh, important to uh, our ability to use the internet today. The third bullet on there, the third major bullet on there is financial functions. Uh, this is the idea of being able to do ATM pen processing. Uh, being able to record uh, or um, submit securely pins through the network and across the network. Now, a lot of you maybe aren't going to require that, but that's an important component in the IBM uh, world. When we start talking about the hardware and the um, HSMs or hardware security modules, uh, IBM does provide some technology that is compliant to those standards and that you can use for ATM pen processing. The last bullet on this chart, the key security and integrity, um, you're not going to go out and implement a crypto system just so you can manage keys. However, I'm going to suggest to you that the, uh, the security and integrity of your keys are fundamental to having a successful crypto infrastructure. Uh, it's kind of a given in cryptography that the good, good guys have access to the keys and the bad guys don't. Uh, if that becomes compromised, if the bad guys get access to your keys, then your data is at risk. Uh, your data may or may not be secure. So the ability to provide key security and integrity is critical to uh, your crypto infrastructure. And hopefully as we go through the next several months, you're going to see that the IBM hardware and software work together to provide you that confidence that, that your key material is protected. So let's go to slide six where we're going to zero in and talk a little bit more about the, uh, the technology or the, or the crypto functions. Um, we'll start with symmetric keys and specifically uh, the triple DES algorithm. Um, IBM actually originally developed the DES algorithm back in the 1970s and, and that has become the foundation for triple DES. Uh, you may have heard that DES has been broken. Um, there's a lot of press and articles about it and that's not exactly true. Uh, there is no magic uh, machine or magic algorithm that if you feed in DES ciphertext that it can spit out the original data. However, what is true is that with the advancement of technology, 
Uh, it is feasible today to build a machine that could do what's called a brute force attack against a DES key and recover that key material in a very fairly short period of time, probably less than a day. And, and the idea of a brute force attack is you simply try every possible key value. You know, again, DES was developed based on an 8-byte key. So you have uh, 64 bits, and actually it's only 56 bits because DES relies on a parity bit. So um, you could try every one of those possible 56-bit combinations, and you could implement a machine that could do that in probably less than a day. Now, there's an industry consultant named Bruce Schneier that's written several books on cryptography, and you probably see him on CNN every time there's a big breach. Uh, <clears throat> He has gone on record as saying that uh, it's within the capability of most governments and even many large corporations. You know, they could build a machine. They have the finances to build a machine that could do that attack in a very short period of time. Well, back in the 1990s, uh, when we saw that with Moore's Law that machines were getting faster and faster and this was going to become more feasible, um, the federal government started looking for alternatives and uh, what they eventually came up with was the triple des algorithm now what triple des is is simply invoking the des algorithm three times and what you're doing is effectively extending your key length from 8 bytes or 56 bits to 24 bytes and the way the triple des algorithm works is you take the first eight bytes of your key and you perform a des encryption against your data so just like you did with single des you would just encrypt the data with the first eight bytes but then you would run that ciphertext that came out of that first encryption operation through the the des algorithm again performing a decryption this time and using a different 8-byte key. So what you would get out of this operation is more ciphertext because the two keys are different. The, the data is going to be just scrambled more. And then you would take a third step and encrypt again using the DES algorithm and the third 8 bytes of your 24-byte key. And this would generate some ciphertext, which effectively now has a 24-byte key. Um, Bruce Schneier, who, who said that you could uh, easily develop a DES cracking machine for a single byte, has said that there's probably not enough silicon in the universe to build a machine that could perform a brute force attack against a triple DES key in a reasonable amount of time. Now, the beauty of this implementation was, you know, when people were migrating from single DES to triple DES, you could use the triple DES algorithm and use the same eight bytes for all three pieces of the key and still communicate with your business, with your partner. So, for example, if you had implemented triple DES technology, but your partner had not, he could only do single DES encryption what you could do is encrypt your data with an 8-byte key, then decrypt it, executing the triple DES algorithm, use the same 8 bytes for the second part of your key, that decryption operation would recover your original clear text, and then you'd perform the third leg of the operation, encrypt again, using the original 8-byte key again as the third part, and you get effectively single DES encryption out of that, you can send that to your partner and he can use his single DES engine and recover your clear text. On the other hand, if you're exchanging data with a partner who does have triple DES technology, now you can make those three keys different values and you've effectively implemented uh, the stronger encryption of triple DES. So <clears throat> triple DES, uh, the federal government has gone on record as saying that uh, Single DES is considered weak because of this brute force attack capability, and um, you should not be using single DES today. They do consider triple DES still to be a viable and secure way of transmitting data, and they've even gone on record as saying that uh, given the pace of, of 
uh, technology, given the, the Moore's Law, they think that triple DES will continue to be secure until about the year 2030. Uh, that's when uh, technology may have advanced enough that you could do a, a brute force attack against the triple DES key. Now, in the early 2000s, you know, they, they started looking at this and realizing that, you know, in 20 or 30 years, uh, triple DES may become weak. So they started looking for another algorithm that could eventually replace triple DES. And they, they basically did a bake-off. Uh, they called for a submission of algorithms that uh, could be implemented to provide more security. And they came up with what is now known as AES, or the Advanced Encryption Standard. And we talk about that on slide seven. Um, there were about eight, uh, well, actually, there were many different algorithms submitted. They we, uh, whittled that down to about eight algorithms that were analyzed and studied. And eventually, uh, they selected the Reijendahl algorithm, which was uh, named after the two Belgian cryptographers that submitted it. Um, and that has become now the uh, advanced encryption standard. AES uses a lot of the same techniques that DES and triple DES use. Um, basically, there's some, some substitution. Uh, there's some tables built in that if your clear text has a certain value, they will substitute another value to replace that. And then they, they start shifting rows around and they mix the columns, uh, going through similar operations, but not identical, but similar operations to scramble the data. Uh, AES relies on a 16-byte block of input data. Uh, DES and triple DES use an 8-byte input block. Uh, AES also uses a longer keys. Um, the original, uh, the algorithm su can support either 128, 192, or 256 bit keys uh, to scramble those 16 byte blocks. With that, that longer key, you get uh, a much larger key universe, uh, which means this, the idea of a brute force attack will be just that much more difficult because there's so many more uh, potential key values. Uh, with a 128-bit key, you potentially have 340 undecillion possible key values. With a 256-bit key, you almost have a Google's worth of key values. So a brute force attack against an AES key would be much, much more difficult, take much longer. Um, when NIST, uh, while NIST has gone on record as saying that they think that triple DES will be secure until about the year 2030, um, they've said they've not put any end of life on AES. Uh, they have not forecast when they think AES might uh, uh, be considered weak. So we've kind of got a, a, a Y2K problem with the triple DES algorithm, although it's not a hard and fast date like January 1 of the year 2000, but somewhere about the year 2030, Technology is going to be fast enough that uh, triple DES would be considered weak. Um, so if customers ask me, you know, what algorithm should I be using? You know, my answer would be, well, if you're using single DES, you ought to get off of it. Now, whether you go to triple DES or AES, um, the, the conversion to triple DES might be a little bit easier. You can simply implement a triple length key, uh, whereas converting to an AES algorithm with 16 byte input blocks may have some impact on your uh, program. So for for simplicity, you could certainly go to triple DES, but in the next 15 years or so, you are going to have to consider migrating to uh, AES because that is considered uh, to be secure over the long term. So with that, that let's go to the, uh, the next slide. I want to go down a little bit of a rabbit trail here and briefly talk about um, chaining. Now, the way that uh, symmetric key or symmetric encryption works, uh, the, the original concept, if you go back to the Caesar cipher and whatever, uh, you're, you're using something called ECB mode or electronic codebook mode. And the idea here is that you take, um, you know, with DES, you take eight bytes of data and you encrypt it with eight bytes of a key, or if you use triple DES, a 24 byte key, you will get some ciphertext. The problem that you run into is that if you encrypt the same data with the same key, you're going to get the same ciphertext. So if you've got a text file with lots of spaces in it, you've got eight bytes of spaces at the beginning of the line, 
It's going to create some ciphertext and eight bytes of spaces at the end of the line. That's going to generate the same ciphertext. Or in the example here on this page, the, the, the image of Tux, you've got lots of repeating uh, white space, you've got lots of repeating black space, and you've got some repeating uh, yellow. So if you do uh, electronic codebook encryption and just encrypt eight bytes over and over again, your ciphertext is not going to be quite as secure. And you can see that in the encrypted copy of, or image of, of Tux there on the right. So there's a technique called chaining. Uh, which we'll look at on the next slide. Uh, this is an example of cipher block chaining. The idea of, of chaining is when you encrypt uh, your first block of data, we'll take some output from that and apply that to the next eight bytes of data so that the cipher text, if it's the same input, will be slightly different. And then the, uh, the, uh, the ciphertext that comes out of the, that second uh, block of encryption will take some output there and apply that to the next block. So effectively what you've done is that when you get to the end of a file or the end of the message, that last block, uh, the ciphertext depends on everything that's gone on before it. So um, as you can see in the image of Tux there on the right, it provides a much stronger encryption uh, capability. And uh, as we get farther on in the heart and talk about the hardware and, and even ICSF, uh, we do support those chaining operations within uh, ICSF and the hardware. So with that, let's go to slide 10. Uh, we're going to change gears here briefly or a little bit and talk about the, uh, the other confidentiality algorithm asymmetric algorithms. Now, asymmetric algorithms are different in they that they rely on two different key values, two uh, keys. They're mathematically related, but they are actually different key values. And, and in a minute, we'll go through an example of, of that. But the idea here is that we create these two keys, and we call, we call them a public key and a private key. Uh, the public key I'm going to make available to anybody that wants to send me a message. They can encrypt their data, their message with my public key, and I can decrypt that message using my corresponding private key. Now, if I shared my public key with everybody that, that's listening to this uh, presentation, uh, each one of you could encrypt your own unique message using my public key and send it to me. I can decrypt every one of those messages with my private key. However, if somebody else on the call gets a copy of your message, they cannot decrypt your message using the public key. The public key will not encrypt it. It must be done with the private key. Now, alternatively, I could encrypt a message with my private key and send it to everyone that's listening to the presentation. Every one of you would be able to decrypt my message using my public key. Now, that doesn't provide a lot of security. Every one of you is going to see the message, but it does provide some authenticity. Every one of, of you will know that that message had to come from me because you're using the public key that's associated with me. So you know that I had to encrypt it with my private key. Um, there's three different types of uh, public key algorithms. Uh, there's RSA, Diffie-Hellman, and elliptic curve. They all rely on what are called trapdoor functions. And the idea of a trapdoor function is that it's easy to process in one direction, but very difficult to process in the other direction. So we're going to see an example in a minute of RSA, uh, but RSA relies on the idea that it's very easy to factor two numbers together, but it's difficult to reverse that process and given the factor, come up with the original two values that were used uh, to, that were multiplied together to generate that number. Uh, Diffie-Hellman relies on uh, logarithms. Uh, it's easy to compute um, the value of g to the x power and g to the y power, 
but it's very difficult to, to calculate uh, g to the xy power and to reverse that process and to come back up or to come up with x and y, the original key values. And then elliptic curve relies on uh, elliptical curve relationships, and we'll touch again, uh, touch on that again a little bit later on. So with that, let's go to slide 11, which is an example of uh, RSA public key cryptography. And what we're going to do here is we're going to go through the process of generating the, your public private key values and then show you how to use that to uh, perform encryption and decryption. So again, RSA relies on the, the idea that it's uh, very easy to multiply two numbers together, but it's difficult to reverse that process and come up with the original two numbers. So we start out with two prime numbers. In our example, we're going to use uh, P and Q, 7 and 17, uh, as, as our original factors. Um, in reality, what you would do is use very large prime numbers, numbers that are hundreds of digits along. And, and that's why it's big news every time a new prime number is found. That has implications in terms of the security of cryptographic systems. But we, we'll start with 7 and 17. The first thing we do is multiply them together, and that's 119. That is actually going to be part of both our public and private key. Each one consists of two parts, the modulus and then the, the values E and D are unique to the public and private key. So both our public key and private key are going to start with 119. Our public key, we're going to simply select an odd number. Uh, we're going to use, in, in this example, the value of 5. And that's our public key, 119.5. Now we need to compute uh, the related private key value, the, the value that's related to that specific public key. And the way we do that is we take our first two numbers, P and Q, and we subtract one from each of those. We subtract one from that odd number that we selected. We multiply all of those together, which equals 384. Add one to that, get a 385. Now we divide that by E, that odd number that we originally chose, and take the, uh, to get D. And that's going to give us the value of 77. So our public key is 119.5. The private key that's related to it is 119.77. So those are our public-private key pair. Now we're going to do some encryption using the, those keys. And, and in reality, for the encryption, we're only going to use the public key. So as we go through this exercise, notice that we're only referencing the public key on this slide, not the private key. So let's suppose I want to encrypt the message of cell, S-E-L-L. -L. Well, it's numeric calculation, so I've got to convert cell to numerics. For simplicity, I'm just going to use the, the corresponding letter of the alphabet. So S is the 19th letter of the alphabet, E is the 5th letter of the alphabet, and L is the 12th letter. So what I want to encrypt is 19, 5, 12, 12. Now, for each of those values, uh, for you know, the letter S, I'm going to raise that character to the value of E. So I'm going to take 19 to the fifth. That's uh, uh, 2,476,099. Then I'm going to divide that by the first half of my uh, public key, the 119, and take the remainder. So... Uh, 2,476,099 divided by 119 leaves a remainder of 66. 66 is my ciphertext for the letter S. Uh, similarly, for the letter E, I'm going to take uh, 5 to the 5th. Uh, I'm going to divide that by 119 and get the remainder, which happens to be 31. And then for the letter L, uh, 12 to the 5th. Uh, take that value and divide by 119 and get the remainder, and it turns out to be 3. So my ciphertext is now 663133. So uh, again, now you're probably, as since you, you, uh, the encrypting, the message has been going to be encrypted by my public key, you're encrypting this message for me. That's the technique you've used to encrypt the, the data. You send me the ciphertext of 663133. On slide 13, I'm going to decipher that. Now, the last slide, we only use the public key. On this slide, we're only going to use the private key. So I'm going to start off and take that first character, 66, and I'm going to raise it to the power of D, 66 to the 77th power. Uh, 
You see where the math starts to get a little bit complicated here? Uh, that's 1, 2, 7, 3, 1, 6, 0, uh, followed by a whole bunch of zeros or, or more digits behind it. Then I'm going to divide that by that first half of my private key, the 119, and take the remainder. And what a coincidence, the remainder is 19. The uh, 19th letter of the alphabet is S. So I'm going to do the same process for E. I'm going to take 31 to the 77th power, divide that by 119, and get the remainder of 5. And I'm going to take 3 and raise it to the 77th power and divide it by 119 and take the remainder and it's L. So my clear text that uh, I have decrypted using my private key is the characters S-E-L-L. -L. So this, this is a simplified example uh, of how the RSA algorithm works. Uh, it does require some pretty complex math and, well, it's a good thing we can do it on computers because they're a lot faster. Let's go to slide 14 where we talk about elliptic curve briefly. Uh, I'm not going to get into a lot of elliptic curve. I, I took calculus in college. I've forgotten a lot of it. I, I can't really explain it. But what I will say is that elliptic curve relies on point multiplication uh, against uh, gra uh, an elliptic curve uh, algorithm. And, and the idea here is that um, if you have a non-vertical line on a, a graph, it will intersect the curve at three distinct points. And then you can relate those points back to each other against the graph. And, and so the idea is that you're going to select two points and establish a relationship to the graph. But it's very difficult to reverse that process. And even if you know what the graph looks like, you can't guess what those two original uh, points were, those uh, x and y values that become your uh, public and private key. Now, the reason elliptic curve is important is because it provides for much shorter key lengths, uh, but still providing the same level of security. The problem that we have is that as uh, technology is smaller and smaller, you know, we're putting um, crypto engines into credit cards and on smart cards today. Well, there's not a lot of room on a card, on a, on a credit card. There's not a lot of room for that chip. And you can't get a whole lot of power to the chip. So it becomes very expensive as key sizes go up to be able to do those calculations on those small chips. Um, when a RSA first came out, the standard was a 512-bit key. Then we went to 1024-bit keys, 2048. Now we can process 4096-bit keys on the IBM crypto hardware. Um, the problem is you know, we can do that very effectively on that big Keck, uh, on the big uh, computers. But if you try and process a 4096-bit key on a, on a credit card engine, it's going to take seconds, if not minutes, to perform that calculation. But if we can get to something that uses a smaller key length, then the uh, performance becomes much more acceptable on a credit card, and that's where elliptic curve comes in. Uh, as you can see in the chart at the top, which comes from uh, the National Institutes of Standards and Ta Technologies uh, SP857 document on uh, key technologies, um, an, an RSA key of 1024 bits, uh, you can get the same level of security from an elliptic curve key of 163 bits. So going forward, it's going to be much easier to uh, put these engines, these, these more robust engines, into credit cards and perform that processing as opposed to uh, the RSA algorithms, which are going to be uh, uh, significantly more expensive. Um, so with uh, the elliptic curve technology, we, we now support that on the crypto hardware. We've got a new master key that's associated with it, and, and we'll talk a lot more about that when we talk about uh, the hardware and then the master keys in the coming months. So let's go to the next slide. Um, I do want to point out that um, you are you need both of these algorithms. Uh, 
the the advantage of the symmetric algorithms is comparatively speaking they are much faster much more efficient uh, it doesn't take as many cpu resources to encrypt data with symmetric key uh, you are not going to encrypt your database with an asymmetric algorithm uh, that that processing is just significantly more uh, complicated um, but the downside of symmetric key encryption is the the idea of key distribution um, you know, let's suppose that we have uh, 100 people on this call listening to this. If I wanted to send data to everybody on the call, I would have to have a unique key pair for every person. So right away, I've got 100 keys that I have to manage. And maybe, you know, if we're sending data in both directions, we have one key for me sending you data, and we have another key pair for you sending data back to me. So I, I now have 200 key pairs. And if we rotate keys periodically, whether it be weekly, monthly, yearly, whatever, I now have multiple generations. So key management becomes a problem with symmetric algorithms. Asymmetric algorithms, on, on the other hand, as, we, as we've just seen, I can have one key pair and I can communicate or, or receive messages from all the 100 people on the call with just one key. So key management isn't the problem there, but key distribution is. And again, these are complementary because what we'll see as we start looking at some of the products that leverage crypto technology is that um, we can use an asymmetric algorithm to encrypt a short message like a symmetric key and then use that symmetric key to encrypt the data. So you'll see that things like System SSL, the encryption facility for ZOS, uh, those will use a symmetric key to encrypt data that needs to be transmitted, potentially lots of data that needs to be transmitted. And then we'll in turn use an asymmetric key to protect that data key, and then we'll send the encrypted data key along with the encrypted data to the partner. The partner can use their public-private key technology to recover the original key and then use that uh, decrypted key to uh, recover their data. So it's, it's important that you realize you will need both of these technologies. They are very complementary. So with that, let's go to slide 16. Uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about data integrity. Uh, data integrity, again, is the idea, can I tell that a, uh, if a message has been changed? Uh, and the, what we use is uh, something called a hash. Uh, a hash is an algorithm that will take a message as, an in, as input and then generate a bit string that represents that message. There's two characteristics of a good hash. One is that you can't reverse the process. You can't take that bit string and recover the original message. Um, your message might be, you know, a, a text or, you know, the book Moby Dick. And all of the characters in Moby Dick could be run through this hash algorithm and you could generate a, a bit string that represents it. Um, you know, the SHA-1 hash generates a 160-bit uh, string. Uh, the SHA-512 hash generates a 512-bit string. But you could take this massive volume as input and basically reduce it down to 160 bits or a 512-bit string that represents that message. The other characteristics of a, a good hash is that it's statistically unlikely that uh, any two messages will generate the same hash value. And, and we'll come back to that in a second. So what I do with a modification detection code is if I'm going to send you a message, I will run that message through my hash algorithm and generate a bit string. And I will send you both the message and the bit string. And, and I'll also tell you which hash algorithm I use, whether it was SHA-1, SHA-4 to uh, SHA-512 uh, or one of the other algorithms, but I'll send you both the message and the hash. When you receive the message, you'll run that message through the exact same hash value or hash algorithm that I did. And if you come up with the same modification detection code that I sent you, you now know that the message did not change either accidentally or deliberately. On slide 17, I give a quick example of a, a hash, not to be confused with a Hormel hash. Notice that I ran the, the string, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog through the SHA-1 hash, and this is the 160-bit string that, I, that it generated, Able 9, Fox 1, and so on. 
Then I changed in the second one, I changed the last word. I changed it from jumping over a hog to a dog. So it's way down at the end of the string, ran it through a SHA-1 algorithm, and I come up with a very different hash value. It starts with 2412. Even though the, the string, the bit I changed was way down at the, the end of the message, from the get-go, uh, the, the hash value changes. So uh, it is statistically unlikely that any two messages can be tweaked and generate the same hash value. On slide 18, we talk about uh, message authentication codes. Uh, this basically just adds a key as input to the, uh, the hash algorithm. So if you and I share a symmetric key value, we, we both have the key value of ABCD, uh, I'm going to send you a message. I'm going to run it through the hash algorithm and apply that key to the algorithm. I'm going to come up with what's called a message authentication code. When you get the message, you run it through the same algorithm using the same key. If you come up with the same MAC value, you know that not only has the message not changed, but it had to come from me because we are sharing that unique key value between us. So message authentication provides uh, integrity in terms of whether the message changed and authenticity in terms of the source of the message. Now, we, we can apply all of that to the concept and, and come up with the concepts of digital signatures. Uh, a digital signature is a way to securely associate someone with the data that they send. So what we're doing here uh, is we're taking uh, uh, a, a hash and then we are signing it, encrypting it with uh, using public private key. Uh, these are used extensively in digital certificates. So let's go to slide 20, which talks about digital certificates. Again, the idea here is um, I want to communicate with everybody on the, on the call. Uh, I need to be able to get my public key to you in a way that you know that it came from me and not somebody pretending to be me. So I want to receive messages from you and, and we want to do that with some security. So what I would do is I would create a public private key pair. The private key I'm going to lock up. I'm the only person that will ever use it. The public key that I need to get to you I, and I need to get it to you in a way that you have some trust in, in where it came from. We use the concept of a certificate authority. Okay, in my example, I'm using VeriSign uh, as my certificate authority. I am going to build what's called a certificate request and send it to VeriSign. And uh, this, this message here has, you know, VeriSign, it has my unique name in it. It has an expiration date for the certificate. It's got some versions in terms of uh, which signature algorithms, which hashes we're using. Um, that kind of information, as well as my public key. And all of this is in the clear in this certificate request. What I do is I send my certificate request to the certificate authority. Hopefully that certificate authority is going to validate, you know, did this request really come from Greg Boyd or did it some, come from somebody pretending to be Greg Boyd? That's the critical part of this process. You've got to trust your CA that uh, they're doing that due diligence and not giving certificates out just to, to anybody pretending to be me. But what the CA does is they take that message and they run it through a hash algorithm and they generate a bit string that represents that message, VeriSign, Greg Boyd with expiration dates and versions and my public key. That hash value, they will then encrypt with their, the CA's, private key. And basically, they just append, and, and that's called a digital signature, the, the hash of the message encrypted by the private key. And basically, they just append that on to the certificate request, and that is the certificate that they send back to me, and I, in turn, to send to everyone on the call. So when you get my certificate, what you're going to do is you're going to take that, that original message and run it through a hash algorithm and figure out what the hash is that represents the message. You're also going to strip that digital signature off the end and decrypt that value with the CA's public key, the certificate authority's public key. 
And if you come up with the same value as was calculated through the hash, you know that you have Greg Boyd's certificate, Greg Boyd's public key that you can now use to encrypt and send data to me with. Now, where does the, the CA's public key come from? Uh, if you've ever gone into uh, Internet Explorer or Firefox and looked at the certificates that are available, many, many CAs come pre-installed in IE and Firefox. Uh, similarly with RACF, uh, when you order RACF from IBM, we package a whole bunch of uh, external CAs into RACF. Now, they're all marked as non-trusted. <coughs> Excuse me. They're all marked as non-trusted. You have to go into the RACF database and, and specify which certificates you want to trust. But basically, those certificates uh, are available to you either in your browser or in the RACF environment. So they are available to you to perform this uh, uh, certificate processing. So with that, Let's turn to the next uh, crypto algorithm or crypto function, rather, of financial services. Um, again, this is associated with ATM pen processing. Now, if you have a credit card where you go in and, and you have to enter your pen value and it's like mine, your pen is probably four numeric digits. So have you ever thought about how those are protected? Um, you know, if you only have uh, the potential values for your PIN are 0000 through 9999. So there's only 10,000 possible PIN values that are available. And if you're a large bank with millions of customers, the chances that any two customers are using the, uh, the same PIN value is fairly high. Um, and even worse, you know, if an insider, maybe a database administrator or a storage administrator has access to your database, if, if you simply encrypt the pin value and store it in a database, um, that DBA who maybe has a credit card through the, that, you know, his bank as well, um, and he knows his, his pin value is 4567, he could go find his record in the database, look at the encrypted pin in the record and, and see that it's uh, encrypted to X, Y, asterisk Z. Uh, he could go look at anybody else in the database that has the same ciphertext. And suddenly he knows all of these other, the, the pin values for all the rows that match his. So obviously that's a problem. And um, the banking industry has come up with a number of techniques for protecting those pin values and, and using techniques so that they don't all look the same, even though they may be uh, uh, the same value. So these are called uh, 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 pin algorithms uh, for encrypting pins. They are very precisely defined and and they must be executed inside what's called an HSM, a hardware security module. Uh, we have implemented these algorithms in our Crypto Express cards, uh, the providing the tamper resistant technology, and we'll talk more about that when we talk about the hardware. But those are all implemented in the HSMs and available to you through ZOS and through ICSF, uh, as, as well as in Linux and all. So uh, financial services is just an extension of encryption. It, it's using DES, TDES, and now we're moving to AES as well uh, to, provide, to protect your PIN uh, information. Slide 22 is, is kind of a gee whiz slide. Um, if you're considering a life of crime and, and want to attack uh, the cryptography, uh, you'd probably be better off playing the lottery. Uh, if anybody remembers back to uh, two two years ago in, in March of 2012, um, there was a mega millions jackpot in the United States at the time, uh, the largest jackpot ever in the United States, uh, jackpot of $640 million. And you had one, in one, one chance in 176 million of winning that lottery. And looking at uh, some of the DES algorithms, the hash algorithms, your odds are much better at winning the lottery than they are of guessing a key value or figuring or ver reversing a hash and figuring out what the original message was uh, with, you know, just with uh, triple DES and, and 200, uh, 2 to the 256 possible key values. 
uh, your odds are significantly are, are significantly higher in trying to guess that. And if you get down to things like uh, AES 256 down there, you got one chance in 77 digits uh, of guessing uh, the the AES key. So um, you'd probably be better off playing the lottery than you would trying to guess the the um, crypto keys. Now I want to kind of wrap things up here. Um, Today we focused on crypto in general and, and just the, the crypto functionality that's available. Um, as we go forward a little bit, um, let's see, we're going, oh, I'm sorry, I hit the wrong slide. Um, in the next couple months, we're going to start looking at things like the hardware. We're going to talk about the CPAC F hardware. Uh, the Crypto Express cards, explore a little bit more about the technology and the functionality that those provide. We'll do those in uh, February and March. And then in April, uh, we're going to turn our attention to ICSF. ICSF is the uh, software component of ZOS that drives the hardware. Um, so we'll talk about the capabilities there, some of the parameters that you can control and that you can set, things that might affect performance, that sort of thing. Um, and that's probably going to take two months as well. So that'll get us uh, through the month of May. Uh, in June, we're going to talk about uh, the process for loading master keys, and, and we'll talk about some of the considerations there and some of the ways that you can do things there. Now, that gets us through the first six months. Uh, at that point, we have a couple different options on directions we can go. Uh, we can focus on some of the products that leverage the crypto infrastructure. Uh, we can talk about system SSL and, and when and how it leverages uh, the CPACF, the Crypto Express cards, when it uses ICSF, that sort of thing. We can look at database encryption. There's a couple of ways to encrypt your database. Uh, we can go through some of the capabilities there. Similarly, for products like the encryption facility for ZOS that uh, does file encryption. We can explore those, or uh, we can do some more of the infrastructure topics, uh, consider things like disaster recovery and how you prepare uh, for a DR exercise or the real thing, and, and what you have to do to make sure that the crypto infrastructure is available at the DR site. We can look at things like performance and some of the expectations in, in terms of what you can expect uh, when you start using this crypto infrastructure, whether it be for system SSL or the database or whatever. We can look at Linux and we can also look at the trusted key entry workstation, which is a, a separate machine that provides secure key entry. Um, so I think it's Jerry's plan probably in the March, April timeframe, maybe to, to do a survey, uh, get people's idea on where they'd go next. And you know we're gonna try and be responsive and, and go in the direction that you all think best. So with that, I'm going to wrap things up. Um, there are a couple references here. Uh, the, as I mentioned, Bruce Schneier, he's written uh, several books. Uh, down at the bottom, uh, the www.counterpain.com, uh, Bruce Schneier does publish a monthly newsletter uh, on topics related to cryptography. Now, his company was called Counterpain. Several years ago, it was bought by British Telecom. And just within the past two or three months, uh, Bruce Schneier has announced that he is leaving British Telecom. So I'm not sure about whether this website is still going to be uh, the way to sign up for the newsletter. Uh, I am still receiving the newsletter from Bruce Schneier, even though he's left. So that may change, but I'm sure if you just Google on Bruce Schneier and look for his newsletter, uh, you would be able to sign up for it. Uh, back up at the top, I'll also mention that the Simon Singh code, the code book, I, I found that very entertaining and, and a fairly easy read if you'd like to, to get a, uh, a little bit more general uh, discussion of cryptography. These are the ICSF or, uh, publications that are available from IBM. Um, just realize that with the availability of ZOS 2.1, uh, the uh, numbering conventions have changed, so each version of these manuals, uh, prior to 2.1, uh, the, the ICSF overview manual was SA22-7519-whatever. And basically with the ZOS 2.1, we just started over with uh, release 0, so it would be SC147505. 
some resources on the web, um, <clears throat> the red books for the current uh, uh, um, ZEC models are uh, out on the red books website. Uh, they do talk about cryptography. They do have some uh, a lot of screenshots in some of those. And then down at the bottom, uh, kind of a shameless plug. Uh, if you're not familiar with the ATS Tech Docs website, uh, this is basically just a search page where you can search on lots of different topics. And if you go to that page and, and type in the search word of crypto, you'll find probably 50 or 60 articles now that I and others uh, uh, have written, uh, kind of smaller bites of things that you can uh, consume a little bit easier. Uh, the synopsis of System Z crypto hardware, uh, we'll cover a lot of that in the next two sessions. Uh, the clear key, secure key, and protected key primer describe the differences, uh, how the IBM hardware is defined. Uh, that's important in understanding cryptography on System Z. So you might want to review those. And then with that, I am going to wrap things up here uh, on the call. We're going to open it for questions. And um, uh, I thank you for your time. And I look forward to talking to you. Uh,